Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our uh, training rounds. Uh, uh, we have two fantastic presenters this morning. Um, my name is Amol Verma. I'm one of the uh, Temerty Professors of AI Research and Education in Medicine, um, and um, really delighted to be introducing um, uh, two excellent uh, presenters today. So just to begin, um, uh, as you probably know, the uh, Temerty Center for AI Research and Education uh, in Medicine at U of T has been made possible by the generous donation of the Temerty family. TKARAM is an interdepartmental center. It serves as a focal point for collaboration among healthcare providers, trainees, researchers, computer scientists, engineers, and industry. Um, and our goal is to transform health through AI. Um, so just a note for our attendees, um, the uh, please use the Q&A function in your Zoom to submit your um, uh, questions for the presenters, and then we'll, they'll be addressed during the discussion portion of the session. Um, and also by attending uh, this event, you're consenting to be um, uh, uh, photographed or recorded for non-commercial use by, uh, by T. Karam. And um, we'll just begin with a land acknowledgement that uh, we wish to acknowledge this land uh, on which the University of Toronto operates uh, for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting uh, place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So today's first presenter is Arman Malhotra. Arman is a fourth year neurosurgery resident and second year PhD student focused on uh, machine learning and health services to understand and improve neurotrauma outcomes. His project will describe the development and internal validation of the automated surgical intervention support tool for traumatic brain injury, otherwise known as ASSIST TBI. So Arman, over to you. Great, uh, thanks very much. And uh, really appreciative to the TKRM uh, Education uh, Committee for allowing me the opportunity to present our work. Um, so as mentioned, I'm a fourth year neurosurgery resident doing my PhD. Um, I thought I'd just start off and frame things a little bit clinically. Uh, so a tale of two brain injuries. So these are both patients that I looked after uh, as a junior resident. The first is a 55 year old lady who was hit by a streetcar. She was comatose on arrival. And I, I won't really go through the neurosurgical kind of image interpretation, but really a concerning scan suggesting there's uh, sort of high pressure in the brain some bruising in the, the right frontal area and the left temporal area with a small subdural here. A uh, very similar case, uh, second patient, a 60 year old man who was hit by a bus, also comatose on arrival. Um, there's some uh, swelling in the frontal area, some contusion in the left temporal area. So very similar scan with some subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, sort of diffusely throughout. So the first lady, um, was taken for a decompressive craniectomy. Uh, what we do is re we remove half of the skull. And the reason for that is when the pressure swells in the brain, um, if you have swelling within a fixed box of the skull, uh, there's a higher mortality associated with these injuries. So we did this surgery, uh, which is a fairly significant operation. But after several weeks um, in the ICU, there was gradual improvement and um, uh, eventually, this patient was discharged to rehab, able to walk and talk and gradually improving. The second patient, unfortunately, was delayed with transfer to the trauma bay. So for anyone who's sort of astute with the neuroimaging, the actual scans we got when they arrived, there was a lot more swelling in the brain. There was a lot more expansion of the contusions in, within this time interval. And the patient was taken for the same operation, but unfortunately had no recovery after two weeks, uh, despite a tracheostomy up, uh, feeding tube in the stomach, and unfortunately remains uh, severely disabled at long-term follow-up. So what happened and what can we learn? I, I really won't pretend that the only factor that's different was one, one of these patients having a delayed presentation to the trauma, uh, to the tertiary care center, but this is certainly a factor and, and importantly, a modifiable one. Uh, you know, I won't minimize the heterogeneity of brain injury, and there's certainly a lot of other factors that contributed to the differences in outcome. So traumatic brain injury is the leading cause of death and disability in young people around the world. It's an increasing cause of morbidity amongst older patients as well as um, age demographics change. 
approximately 165,000 Canadians are injured annually, which equates to about one person every three minutes. And roughly 20% of those injured patients actually die because of a traumatic brain injury. So we know from other literature that the expeditious identification and appropriate triage to specialized trauma centers is, is, is a critical first step. And so really this allows for interventions such as decompressive craniectomy, which minimize secondary injury and optimize outcomes. So this is the, the intrinsic problem. When we're trying to give uh, provide care in Ontario, this is what the map looks like. Every dot is essentially a neurosurgical care center that can do these kind of operations and provide this tertiary trauma care. The reality is we have to provision this over a massive geographic area. And so this really contributes to this illusion of universal access. So really your postal code uh, dramatically dictates your access to these sort of specialized services. And so the expectation is really different from the reality. This is uh, our the, the senior author on this paper and in the operating room. You know, it's not uncommon to be called from an outside center. You're in the middle of a surgery. A nurse is holding a phone up. You're totally sterile and you're quickly trying to scroll through the images to figure out, does this patient need to be referred or do they have not such a bad brain injury that they can actually be monitored at the other hospital? And so you imagine this is nonstop. Uh, basically coming at all, these calls come in at all times during the day and night and uh, contribute to burnout, inefficiencies in care and uh, delays in transferring patients. So the problem restated is we really need a clinical decision support system. So a surgical decision making we know is based on actually fairly few variables. It's mainly imaging and a few clinical features. However, this really requires interpretation from a specialist such as a neurosurgeon. So it's very challenging for someone to figure out whether, you know, this scan or this scan is at higher risk for needing neurosurgical intervention. So no group has effectively used CT-based AI methodology to tackle the problem of triage for head injury patients. What I will say is other groups have certainly um, takes, taken segmentation-based approaches and uh, been able to flag hemorrhage, but this is a clinically useless functionality for actually triaging patients. The number of patients with positive CT findings on a CT head is way larger than the number of patients that actually need to come for neurosurgical intervention. And so we wanted to develop and assess a deep learning model to predict the requirement for neurosurgical intervention using acute traumatic brain injury scans. So to do this, we use the Institutional Ontario Trauma Registry Database at St. Michael's Hospital. So for patients with trauma, uh, multiple variables are, are captured by uh, trained abstractors for the Ontario Trauma Registry. So we specifically looked at traumatic brain injury AIS codes, uh, abbreviated injury severity scores, and um, uh, CCI codes. So a CCI code, anytime someone has a surgery or a procedural intervention, they get uh, there's a CCI code associated with that. So we created a list of CCI codes associated with the presence of neurosurgical intervention, and we use these to define our sort of ground truth of what happened to the patient, whether they actually had surgery or didn't. A uh, few exclusions are listed, which only apply to the development cohort. I put this dotted line here to show that this simulated prospective testing cohort is actually a more generalized uh, group uh, without particularly uh, the cutoff of Glasgow coma scale scores. The reason in training we remove patients who were in deep comas was because there are other confounding reasons that these patients may not have surgery. So for example, it's not infrequent that we see such a bad brain injury that the scan looks very surgical, but for us, we decide no surgery is indicated because even with surgery, something invasive, we know there's no way we can help this patient. And so we didn't want that bias to be introduced into the um, uh, model development, but we certainly wanted to assess the robustness of this modeling assumption in the uh, stage four simulated prospective testing cohort. So that was not a restriction imposed here. And in particular, this actually is likely to affect older adults. Uh, often they have do not resuscitate care goals where they um, or their family decides that, you know, if a 90 year old has a huge uh, brain bleed that they wouldn't want that invasive operation. And so we didn't want to introduce bias against older patients uh, by sort of 
invariably looking at markers like brain age through the modeling. So pictorially, this is uh, the, the flow, sheet, uh, flow chart for the cohort creation. So we identified um, 2,800 patients for training, validation, and testing, which was split as shown here. Um, and what I'll highlight is uh, the class balance was actually quite good. So we had uh, around 1,100 patients with uh, undergoing surgery within 72 hours of trauma and around 18 or 1,700 that were non-surgical. So this is quite, quite well-balanced. And uh, I'll just point out that 1,000 patients during this process were excluded because they had severe brain injury based on their level of consciousness and they did not undergo surgery, which told us that um, they were likely either severely brain injured or actually do not resuscitate care goals. Um, so to speak a little bit about the model development, uh, we had a few pre-processing steps. So unenhanced images were acquired on general electric CT scanners. There were multiple generations uh, of, of scanners used over the study period. Um, DICOM conversion to NIFTY, uh, there was a mixture of two and a half millimeter and five millimeter slices. The reason being that two and a half millimeter slices are actually a finer detail to look for skull base fractures. So in order to use both of these scan types, we resampled in the inferior to superior direction to uh, ensure uniform spacing. And these were registered to verified uh, head CT templates using the, the ANT uh, software package. Uh, the, uh, the TRISA or TRSAA, uh, which stands for these kind of transformations, this was used uh, in the registration process and ultimately resampling all the scans to a common image uh, volume space uh, of voxel spacing and dimensions was important as, as a pre-processing step, as with a lot of kind of computer vision applications. Uh, there was some augmentation used during training uh, where we induced rotational variability uh, to try to increase the robustness of the model by uh, varying images about 10 degrees. Um, so the model we that actually was was sort of the optimal performance model was a vision transformer model, which was based on the 16 by 16 uh, paper uh, published by Google in 2000, uh, or sorry, 2020. And um, uh, this architecture involves dividing a CT scan into one-dimensional patches or tokens a learnable spatial embedding layer is then added to each of these patches. The positionally embedded tokens are then passed into a transformer encoder. And this workflow is sort of shown in this schematic on the right. The output from the transformer encoder then serves as the input to train a multi-layer perceptron um, classification head, uh, which essentially is, is a binary classifier uh, at, at the end where we're representing the ground truth of whether a patient underwent neurosurgical intervention. Um, and so it really uh, outputs this prediction of surgery versus no surgery. And so um, we, we did look at other models and we didn't go straight to a vision transformer model. We actually uh, initially were, look, were working with a ResNet 18 uh, convolutional neural network model. And really we showed that the, the vision transformer model for this particular task uh, performed um, you know, substantially better across the board and certainly better than a clinical variable model alone, which we, um, the, the highest performance clinical variable model was a support vector machine. And so this is just shown as a bit of model selection that was, uh, that went into uh, the, the development process. So I, I alluded to this simulated deployment data. And what we did is this is a temporally distinct uh, consecutive uh, set of trauma patients that uh, were accrued between 2021 and 2022. And this cohort, there was no restriction based on the level of coma. And so it was a bit more of a generalized sample that was temporally distinct from any of the previous cohorts that I mentioned. And so when we compare the development and testing set, so this, this is the subset of that original 2,800 scans that was held out for uh, testing compared to the simulated deployment set, which is this 18 months of consecutive data. Uh, and really we can see well-preserved test characteristics across the board. And particularly I'll highlight this negative predictive value, which um, uh, is quite, quite good considering that uh, we really want to reduce the inflow of scans that really don't need to be sort of triaged as urgent. Um, and so, 
model explainability is important. We manually reviewed, uh, you know, all of the uh, misclassified cases as well as a large sample of the true positive and true negative cases. And here are a few examples of. Um, and what I'll point out again is there's no um, there's no uh, segmentations here. There's no one has gone in and done any scan level labels of you know regions of importance or anything like that. These are purely fed into the the pipeline, and um, the model is predicting these as high risk of needing surgical intervention. And certainly, these patients, you know, these are all for people who are neurologically like kind of aware of different scans. These are all very urgent looking scans, and certainly the true negative uh, cases. There's a lot of face validity here. These were small subgaleal hematomas, a bit of interhemispheric subarachnoid hemorrhage, some subdural blood on the tentorium. These are really non-urgent scans and scans that would be very, very unlikely to need surgery. The false negatives are very important. These are cases that were predicted negative but did have surgery. Uh, the main theme was uh, patients meeting uh, brain trauma foundation guidelines for ICP monitoring. So a patient who has a very minimal blood in the brain, so this scan alone is not concerning. But if this patient is in a deep coma, it becomes very concerning. And so, so it's really a clinical variable that's driving the indication for neurosurgical intervention. And so in combination with, you know, it, it, in a real life setting, if a patient had a Glasgow coma scale score uh, of, of, you know, a deep coma, then that would sort of trump whatever the imaging was and would really uh, be important to get that patient assessed. There were a few cases where, because we only deployed the model on the first scans, um, it, it was unable to predict hemorrhage expansion that happened in a delayed fashion. So for example, I was actually on call for this case as a junior resident, and this patient had a much larger epidural hematoma about six hours later. The other uh, kind of theme was very rare injuries were clearly underrepresented in the training data. So this is a patient with the tip of a knife in the skull, and so this was operated on. But again, that's a very uncommon injury, uh, thankfully, and um, so likely was underrepresented in the training data. The themes with positive or false positives were really uh, exactly what I mentioned earlier. So patients with large hemorrhages that were deemed non-surgical. So for example, this patient, just looking at the scan, clearly needed needs a evacuation of this hematoma, but this was an older adult in whom the family was not uh, not on board with any sort of aggressive intervention. And so this patient was palliated. Um, and so that was sort of a common theme. And, and you can see some congenital anomalies like a Dandy Walker malformation where the whole posterior fossa is missing in this case is another example of a false positive where there's sort of aberrant anatomy. So this culminated to this uh, publication. And so this is, uh, I have a QR code to this paper, um, which uh, I, I do want to um, uh, really sort of uh, acknowledge Chris Smith, who's the co-first author on this work, and he brings uh, a data science perspective and really helped me understand and, and sort of get better at a lot of this uh, where I come from a clinical background. So I think, you know, it really um, uh, alludes to the fact that uh, multidisciplinary teams are important for this kind of work. Uh, also, Chris Hamill and Derek Beaton were really integral uh, from the data science perspective at uh, Unity Health. Uh, and it's cut off for the senior authors, but Chris Smith, oh, oh, sorry, Chris Wittu and Errol Kolak provided a lot of supervision in this, uh, this work. So a couple of things and updates uh, with what's going on now. Uh, this, this model has been silently deployed, and this was one of the first cases that flagged positive um, and, and generated this triage alert uh, to one of the investigators, Chris Wittu. And uh, so this was an essential step to make sure that this model could fit in with existing data structures and pipelines at St. Mike's, as well as to explore kind of implementation problems that may come up. Um, we also looked at, and this is unpublished data, so how does it actually compare to humans? So we took 300 TBI head CTs, uh, ran our assist TBI model, and this is a confusion matrix. And we also had all six neurosurgeons at St. Mike's um, go through this as well. And we actually showed that uh, assist TBI performs uh, just as well, if not slightly better than um, uh, than humans making these decisions. So this is uh, uh, we often assume that the ceiling of performance is is the human value, but actually there is error at the level of humans as well. So when we're when we're thinking about these kind of tools, that's often uh, neglected. 
And finally, uh, really proud to say that currently all St. Michael's Hospital Emergency Department and trauma-based CT scans actually run through the ASSIST TBI model in real time. So that involved understanding the data pipeline and flows. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, Derek uh, Beaton and Chris Hamill and Mohamed Mamdani's team uh, was very in integral in allowing us to translate this model into real clinical deployment. And so we're really uh, uh, unpacking sort of how, how this is performing in real time. And uh, right now this generates a uh, radiology dashboard, or sorry, an emergency department um, alert on the, uh, the dashboard in the emergency at St. Mike's. Uh, so we hope that this model will improve the expeditious triage of injured Canadians requiring acute neurosurgical intervention, uh, hopefully reduce burnout amongst trauma, neurosurgery, and emergency uh, workforce, and maximize access to specialized care for patients with TBI across large geographic regions. Um, future direction. So we have a paper in submission as well, where we ask the question of, you know, what about multimodal data? So we had a clinical variable model alone, and we had an imaging model alone. What if we unify these? And, and is that actually a synergy? Or is that something that's not uh, as synergistic as it could be? And so we actually show, uh, again, this manuscript's not out, but clinical variables are far less useful than images for this uh, use case. And actually, the marginal improvements in performance likely comes at the detriment of deployment challenges. So if you think about, um, you basically need a pack system uh, to retrieve images and deploy the model. But if you start introducing age, uh, Glasgow coma scale score, presence of alcohol intoxication, um, humans or EHRs have to then interface with the model to deploy to, to place those uh, um, values in uh, to kind of actually get real-time predictions. And this is not a trivial task, especially when a lot of trauma patients are unknown, unidentified, they're found down, they don't have ID. There's often delays getting this, this information when we see them in the trauma bay. Um, we also need to do external validation in settings with different test characteristics. And so currently that's in progress where we're um, uh, working with um, St. Joseph's, a community site to, to do this external validation work, as well as several centers in Europe uh, to get some external validation out of country uh, data and, and finally measuring impact. So did we actually set out to do what we wanted to do? So this is sort of a snapshot of where we are. So we made some progress, but there's there's certainly a lot of work to do. And um, uh, yeah, uh, so again, like to thank the team. Um, my PhD supervisors are actually uh, Avery Nathans and Jeff Wilson. Uh, Chris Wittu is on my committee. And again, very appreciative to the co-first author on this work, Chris Smith, for uh, teaching me a lot throughout the process. So thanks very much. Thanks so much for sharing, <clears throat> Armand. That was, that's um, really uh, exciting and incredible work. Um, huge congratulations on sharing really like a broad sweep from like model training, development, validation, right through to sort of some of your experiences with deployment. Um, uh, so I have a, 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 some questions, but I uh, actually I want to start with our, so our co-adjudicator today is Dr. Human Koshravani, and this is right in his wheelhouse as a neurointensivist. So Human, do you want to ask the first question? Thank you so much. Arman, I also agree with Dr. Mahotra. I think you've done a tremendous job. I really uh, commend you guys on how you've translated it and also um, very bold of you to, to clearly say, you know, what variables matter more and versus, uh, uh, you know, impeding implementation. I just wanted to ask you, what do you think is your number one barrier to implementation? Uh, if you were to try to help people kind of in the provincial model, like for those on the call who may not understand, neurosurgery only lives at big academic centers. And so all neurosurgical practice works in what's called a hub and spokes model where other referral centers must send their patients to big academic centers. And so uh, stuff like this really helps. And, and so the question is, what would be your number one deployment challenge you think in the current models and the healthcare system funding situation we have? Yeah, th thanks very much, Dr. Kostravani. Um, I think we're really encountering this sort of fire hose effect. So I think when you uh, develop a model like this, you curate a sample of trauma patients only, but at, you know, as, as you know very well, um, the the severely injured neurological patient can be very undifferentiated. So when you start to think about provincial deployment and even what we're seeing in the emergency, um, 
it, it's very tricky to, so if you're running the model, you ideally for the end user, I think it's easiest if the model can just be deployed on all head CTs. But then when you start to do that, uh, it becomes very problematic. So if someone has a ruptured aneurysm and they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, that actual pathology is not captured in our training data. And similarly, if someone has a melanoma metastasis in their brain, that's a hemorrhagic brain metastasis. So it can look like a hemorrhage. And again, even if the patient hadn't had, had trauma, I think educating individuals who may be interacting with this model that this is a trauma uh, sort of model is, is pretty important. And that's one of the things that we've had to refine our labels in the emergency at St. Mike's. Uh, we're also kind of in the pro in the early phases of trying to think of maybe a, a preliminary classifier model to sort of uh, flag ICH and trauma and differentiate that from tumor, um, uh, you know, infection, some of these other uh, uh, pathologies. And so in the in the emergency now at St. Mike's, we have a label when it comes up with a flag, it says, you know, provided you are concerned about trauma in this patient. Um, this this individual was flagged as high risk of needing uh, neurosurgical intervention. And um, yeah, so, so, so I think that fire hose effect is certainly problematic when you start looking at real data. That's excellent. Thank you. We'll open up to the audience for the time we have. We have a few minutes, I guess. Yeah, so we have some questions in the chat. So um, uh, there's a question. So we'll start with the first one. Um, did you encounter any missing data and how did you deal with it? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So missing data becomes um, very influential when we're looking at clinical covariates. Uh, for the purposes of our, uh, our scans, it's actually very uncommon for a head injury patient to not have a CT. So the only sort of missing data we encountered for the image only model, which is, which is what assist TBI ended up being was uh, patients who had their first scan was post-operative or they had their first scan um, was uh, uh, highly motion degraded. So these were the cases where we actually screened all of the collages uh, before training the data to remove patients that had like non-diagnostic super motion degraded uh, scan, but that represented a minority of cases. Uh, the case where we would we would only have a post-operative scan is when we know a patient has imaging from an outside hospital and they come in and they they don't have absence of all brainstem reflexes. We would take them right to the operating room in many in, in some cases. So th that's the missing data we encountered. Yeah, thanks. And um, maybe just to that point, and maybe broadening it a little bit as you think about generalizing, like obviously, so you're capturing because your scans are at say Mike's you're missing those like peripheral scans that were actually the scan like ultimately that's like one of the areas that you want to use for your deployment right and so curious kind of uh, two or two related questions so one any bias that might creep in as a consequence of that specific phenomenon like that selection effect um and two other biases related to who does and does not get surgery. So obviously, you know, you spoke about how there's a lot that goes into that. Was there any way that you could think about um, or that you've thought about, obviously, in this very thoughtful approach, um, what biases might be encoded into your model um, and how you might interrogate the model for those kinds of biases to avoid amplifying some of them that maybe are undesirable? Yeah, yeah, no, great questions. Uh, very important for this topic. So uh, for the first Part of your question, it was about the selection bias inherent in doing this kind of work at a level one trauma center. And so certainly that exists. So the pretest probability of a neurosurgical pathology in the emergency department at St. Mike's is way higher than at a community center. And that's demonstrated by the class balance. Like we had a very similar number of surgical compared to non-surgical cases. Whereas we know from the population in, in Ontario that it's really you know, when you look at neurosurgery referrals on a whole, only about 20% of them are actually accepted by the, the provider that's uh, receiving the call. So we certainly have a well-represented sort of diverse set of pathology because we are the accepting center for, uh, you know, multiple sites around the province. So I think um, 
before, and the reason we haven't deployed it anywhere other than St. Mike's is because of this lack of external validation data, where we need to demonstrate in a community setting with different pretest probabilities that this model can generalize to that population. So that, that remains a question, and that's why we're actively pursuing this sort of European collaboration as well as um, uh, collaboration with the community set site uh, at um, St. Joseph's. The second aspect of your uh, question, which um, was, uh, sorry, can you can you remind like me? Other biases in who oh, does biases. Like yeah. surgery. Yeah, so I didn't actually show it, and I should have in hindsight. So uh, for all misclassified cases, we actually tested across classified compared to uh, misclassified. Uh, we just did simple statistics to look at whether there were significant differences in the uh, mean age of those patients the sex differences of those patients and the coma severity of those patients. And we didn't find that there were uh, any differences between misclassified and classified and correctly classified cases. However, I think that method of identifying these sort of groups is uh, in, in a pre-specified way is important at every level. So at external validation, at real-time deployment, when we look back at our data over the last few months, I think it's important to keep checking that we're not sort of um, biased in, uh, uh, based on some patient attributes. Perfect. Um, thanks so much, Armand. So maybe there's a few, um, questions in the chat that are quite specific. And so maybe I'll ask you to just respond to them via text in the chat and we'll sure, move yeah. on to our next, uh, to our next presenter. And just to the higher level question of, uh, how to get medical students involved, maybe we'll leave that for a discussion at the very end. Um, uh, um, Sabrina, I see you have your hand up. Was it something uh, pressing that you wanted to uh, say before we move on to our next uh, presenter? Or was it related to your question in the chat? Yeah, thank you. I wrote it in the chat and also oh, just perfect. wanted an incredible presentation. Uh, well done. Great. Thank you so much um, for the comment. Um, so why don't we move on um, to our next uh, presenter? So our next presenter today is... Uh, uh, you, she, and I'm just going to pull up the introduction here. Give me one second. It's a problem of having multiple windows open at once. So um, uh, she's a second year PhD student in biostatistics at the University of Toronto. Prior to this, she received an MSc in biostatistics from Yale University. Use research focuses on predicting cancer dependency maps um, with uh, unsupervised deep domain adaptation. So uh, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. And I, oh. I'm Yu, and today I'm very happy to share our project predicting a cancer dependency map of breast cancer patients with unsupervised deep domain adaptation. And today I will go through introduction, data, model, application, and a conclusion. As most machine learning methods are trained based on the assumption that the testing and deploy data are assumed to be your ID from the same distribution as the training data. This is known as in distribution. However, this assumption doesn't always hold in reality, and the test and deployment samples can be out of distribution, which results in distribution shifts between training and data use during testing and deployment phase. And what's distribution shift? Let Captain X denote an input space and Captain Y an output space. And we define small x belongs to input space and small y belongs to output space. And PCXY is joint distribution of input samples and output labels. And we all know that the joint distribution can be factorized in two ways. PXY equal to PY given x multiple PX. And PXY also equal to PX given Y multiple PY. And any part change in these two formulas can result in different joint distribution. Therefore, there are three types of distribution shift. The first one is covariance shift. 
That means Px changes between source and target, but Py gives x to keep constant. The second one is concept shift. That means Px remains constant, but Py gives x changes. The last one is label shift. That's Py changes, but Px given y remains constant. In the machine learning models often struggle with out of distribution data leading to poor performance issues due to distribution shift. Therefore, enhancing the generalization ability of machine learning and statistical models for unseen data is very important. And the distribution shift issue is also common in healthcare-related fields, and the significance of serving out of distribution issues should also be recognized. For example, sometimes we only have preclinical data, like cell lines data, patient-driven xenographs data. But we want to do some prediction in human tumors or analysis in human tumor. Although they are very similar, but there are still some specific factors like immune system, tumor microenvironment, and vas vasculature. And this will lead to distribution shift between domains. So specifically, in the realm of oncology, cancer dependency maps have emerged as a vital tool in identifying essential genes for the cancer cell proliferation. A cancer dependency map serves as a valuable resource for discovering new therapeutic targets and understanding the genetic dependency that drive cancer progression. However, we can't perform those of function screen on human directly. It underscores the need for machine learning algorithm capable of overcoming discrepancy and bridging the gap between the cancer cell line-based preclinical research and the patient-based clinical applications. So in this project, our objective is build a dumb adaptation model that provides that can predict human cancer dependency map using human cancer patient gene expression profiles through the learned relationships between cancer cell lines, dependency scores, and their gene expression profiles. And next, I want to introduce the data used in the project. There are four data, set, data, set, data sources, including broad data, sample data, RNA data and the TCGA data. The first three data sets are all cancer cell lines, and the TCGA data set is patient tumor data. Broad data is from Harvard Broad Institute, Sanger data is from Wellcome Sanger Institute, and both data sets use the CRISPR screen measures. And although RNA data set is also cancer cell lines, but it uses a different method, RNA screen method. And these three data are labeled. So we use the cancer cell line specific dependency scores and the corresponding expression data. And TCGA is tumor data from the cancer dependency atlas. And it's unlabeled, so we only use expression data of breast cancer patient from this data set. So in summary, predictors of our model is gene expression data, and outcome is CRISPR or RNA dependent scores. And we choose to use measured and supervised dominant adaptation. This method lends a well-performing model on uh, unsupervised target data distribution from source data distribution. More specifically, our source data is cancer cell line gene expression and uh, dependence scores. We use this data to train the model and use unsupervised domain adaptation to apply this information to target the data, patient, patient gene expression and do the final prediction on tumor-specific dependency scores. So our method leverage deep unsupervised dumb adaptation incorporating coral loss to significantly align the feature distribution between the source and target domain. So here, our source data is labeled cancer lens data, and target data is unsupervised patient tumor data. And there is a distribution between their, their features. So we use Carlos to align feature and create a new feature space. And in this way, we can eliminate distribution discrepancy between source and target.
And when we use this method, it's a good way to achieve our objective. First, a different marginal distribution of gene expression data between cancer cell lines and tumor, indicating that they have different feature distribution, different PX. And they share very similar biological mechanism between cancer cell lines and tumor, indicating that they have very similar conditional probability, PY given X. And we also have the access to feature data during the training. So use DOM adaptation, we can mitigate discrepancies between cancer cell lines and TCGA, ensuring that the relationship remain robust and applicable. And this is model architecture of our methods. You can see that we have two source data, Sanger and RNAi. And we want to do the prediction on the patient tumor TCGA data. However, TCGA data is unlabeled, so we can't evaluate the model performance on it. To better evaluate the model performance, we choose another labeled data, broad data as a test set. And here we assume it's unlabeled, and we're just using its feature values while training and use its labels during the testing. And the TCGA data is used as a deployment set. And in the training phase, all three data sets go through shared feature extraction network, and then two source data go through two separate prediction network, predictor A and predictor B. And target data fits into prediction net, both prediction networks and take an average of prediction value from A and B as a final result. And the total loss of the method include three components. The first one is supervised loss, MSE, because here we have two source data, SANG and RNAi. So here we have two supervised loss, MSE A and MSE B. And the second loss is car loss. We calculate car loss between source and the target. And the last one is L2 distance. And L2 distance calculated to use different predicted value from two prediction networks. And the total of that to sum up all of this loss, MSE, Carlos, and L2 distance. And we add another two hyperparameters, lambda one and lambda two, to control the relative weight to the Carl and L2 loss to the total loss. And the model is optimized by minimizing the total loss. And here we show the formula of Carlos. You can see that we use Carlos minimizing the difference in the second order statistics between source and target features. And it's just the difference between CS and CT. CS and CT denote the feature covariance matrix of source domain and target domain respectively. And the formula F squared denotes the squared matrix for business for norm. And why we choose broad data as target and Sanger and RNA data as source. First, the broad data has the best results and it has a very similar normalization method of expression data as TCGA. Sanger and RNA data has a diverse labeled data. If we include diverse distribution data in our model and our model have a better generalization ability in prediction. And also, these two data sets have a different marginal distribution with target data. And in model evaluation and prediction strategy, in the training validation and testing, we choose to use Sanger data and RNA data in the source domain. And these two data sets are used across all phases, training, validation, and testing. And in the target domain, Raw data and TCGA data are divided into training and validation. And we randomly choose 70% data as training and left 30% data as validation. And the entire broad data set is employed for the testing to assess generalization. And in the deployment phase, 
Sangre data and RNI data used through the deployment phase in SourceDomain, and TCGA data is fully used during the deployment in the target domain. It may be more clear showing in this figure. You can see that we always use Sanger and TCGA in training, validation, testing, and deployment. And in training and validation, bot and TCGA data are target. Or in the testing set, broad data is target, and in the deployment set, TCGA data is target. We evaluate the performance of the model using the Pearson correlation, R squared value, and the mean squared error MSE between true and predicted dependency scores. And we compare performance with baseline method, including deep depth, which is deep learning method. And deep depth also use transfer learning architecture as they print train tumor data, fine tune cancel cell lines data, and do the final prediction on tumor data dependency score. And we also compare with other machine learning methods like Lasso, Range, and SVR. And this method all use the gene expression as independent variable and the dependent score as dep dependent variables. And due to large number of features in our data set, and the fact that range regression and SVR don't include a feature section step, so we incorporate PCA with both range and SVR methods. And that is result of our model. And summarizing it in this table, we can see that the model result of our model, deep depth, lots of PCA and range PCA and SVR. And you can see that our math always achieve best results. And it has the lowest MSE value, 0 0.09. And it has the highest correlation, 0 0.74. And have a good R squared value, 0 0.52. And to better visualization the relationship between original dependent score and the predicted dependent score, this will show this scatter plot. We can see a significant linear trend between these two values. This concludes that the consistency between our original dependent score and the predicted dependent scores. Next, so we also want to explore more about the application of dependent scores, and it's also the way to validate the model performance on tumor data, because our tumor data is unlabeled. In the first applications, we try to predict ER positive, HER2 positive subtype status using predicted dependent scores of TCGA breast cancer. And here we use the Lusto and SVM model. And because ER positive and HER2 positive subtypes are clinically significant because they are represent distinct biological and clinical characters of breast cancer. And there are lack of ER positive, HER2 positive subtype specific target therapies. And understanding and predicting these subtypes can directly inform treatment decisions and improve patient outcomes. Well, we need to take overlap with ER positive, HER to positive data set. And finally, finally, 119 samples left in final analysis. And 62 samples in some subgroup one and 57 samples in subgroup two. And in these models, the predictors are predictor patient specific dependency scores that's 60 and 601 gene features. And outcome is ER positive, HER positive subtypes status. And next, we also want to use dependence, dependency scores to identify synthetic lethality gene pairs for drug repurposing for the ER positive, HER to positive breast cancer patients. And here we use the method synthetic lethal identification in R. This is a statistical framework for identifying synthetic lethality pairs from large scale perturbation screens. And here we focus on subgroup two because it has worse prognosis 
and uh, what survival outcomes. And in this analysis, we not only predict dependent scores, we also need another data set, mutation data. And these two data sets are input data for this method, SLIDER. And use this method, we can get a synthetic lethality pair, and we compare our pair with published work. And uh, in this way, we can validate our results. Uh, this is a brief introduction for synthetic lethality. It refers to gene pairs for which an operation in other gene alone doesn't affect cell viability, but operations in both genes are fatal to the cell. So when we implement this method, our variability data is just predicted dependent scores that 600 genes across 56 patient within subgroup two of ER positive, HER to positive samples, because this group have worse survival outcomes. And our mutation data, we got mutated genes reported by C. Bell Potter, and there are two setters. First one is white type it. That means there is no mutation detected in those genes. And the second one is mutated. Mutation matrix details the mutation status of driver gene across patients. And we select the genes from tier one of cancer gene census as driver genes. And because this method requires more than one mutation per patient. So finally, only 11 genes included in our final analysis. What is the result of our application? You can see the results of prediction of subgroups. This is ROC curve for LASO and SVM. We can see that these two methods achieve, achieve a very high ROC ALC value. And for LASO, it has ROC ALC 0.93, and uh, SVM have the value 0.89. And in the identification of synthetic lethality gene pairs, and we finally found a significant affair, a pair, FOXA1 as a driver gene and KDSR as a drug target gene. And from the plot, you can see that for the patient, of gene KDSR result uh, reduced the variability only in mutated samples and not in wide typed samples. And we compare our results with published work. And we found that KDSR gene has been proven to be a pro potential drug target for breast cancer, which is consistent with our results. So in conclusion, out of distribution issues are prevalent in healthcare related machine learning models and can significantly compromise their predictive accuracy. Dummy adaptation measures signifies promising advancements in out of distribution generalization for therapeutic intervention. And the synthetic lethality pair of FOXA1 and KDSR provides a strategic pathway for developing target therapies and potentially improving treatment specificity and effectiveness for breast cancer patients. So in the future, a multi-omics dependent score predictor should also correct for the difference between preclinical models and human tumors which will require a multi-omics dummy adaptation approach. And also exploring the application of our model to other types of cancer could provide insight into its versatility and adaptability. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. And welcome to any questions. Thank you so much, uh, you. What a fantastic uh, presentation. We have about five minutes for questions, which is great. Um, I know Human was on call, actually, um, so I'm not sure if he's uh, still here. If he does, if he is, um, uh, Human, just pull yourself off uh, um, mute and then um, 
feel free to jump in and ask a question, but maybe in the interest of time, actually, there's a question in the chat and I had a similar question about your different data sets. And maybe you could walk to that slide where you had all the different data sets. The, the question in the chat is, um, what is the development data set? How is it different from the validation data set? Um, kind of, I guess, hilariously, I had I had a question about the other two data sets, which is what is the testing and the deployment uh, data set? Um, uh, so uh, maybe you could uh, just explain to us the different data sets and how they were used differently. You mean the different or oh, the different data sets? Okay. Like, uh, you know how you had that, there was one slide that showed sort of uh, testing, deployment, uh, development, validation. So maybe you could just say, what did you use each of those sort of four data sets for? Yeah, because we, oh, it just mentioned that, oh, I didn't share this. Cool. Oh, because I just mentioned that because I choose Sangor and RNI data set as a source data because they are kind of cell lines data set. And also they have diverse labeled distribution and we invert, oh, we include a di different distribution data set. Our model can have a better prediction ability. And we, because a broad data have a very similar feature distribution as TCGA, and we want to use broad data to mimic the distribution of TCGA. So we treat broad data here uh, in the target. And then we also tried another combination, for example, put the single data in the target and put broad data in the source. But the result is worse than this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I had another question, which was related to kind of just overall, um, uh, you know, you commented about how you were able to compare your work to some of the baseline or other uh, existing methods. Could you yeah. um, maybe summarize for us, and I think you started to get there towards the end, what would you say is sort of the most important methodological contribution of your work beyond the methods that currently exist? Obviously, there's a, a performance improvement that you showed us. Um, what do you think accounts for this performance improvement uh, from a methods perspective? So firstly, I think... Uh, our our method consider the uh tr consider the target data during the training is a good step in prediction, and also I didn't show the many details here. And here actually our method only use genes pressure data to do the prediction, but as the uh, other method, if other method want to align distribution, they need another data set like functional prediction data set. That means our method use uh, less data have a better result. So I think it's uh, a good improvement in our uh, model. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Yeah. So so you think it's uh, it, one you can train with less data. So that's the that's one of the major benefits. Yeah, yeah. And we also consider the target data during the training and balance the distribution between source and target in the training phase. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, uh, that was a wonderful presentation, and I think we're coming right up on time. Um, so I'll just thank our uh, presenters again. We really appreciate uh, the, the amazing work you, you are both doing. Um, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, and I'll just remind everyone in the last minute here, a few quick things. Um, this is the first of five training round sessions. So please come back for the next ones. Details are on the TKRM website. There's a 10 week online professional development course this summer. Uh, an application deadline is coming up on June 2nd. So uh, if you wanna learn about Python programming and other things. Um, and then finally, TKRM is hosting its first symposium devoted to multimodal data on June 17th. Um, and it'll be live streamed so you can attend virtually. So please check it out. Oh, everything is on the uh, TKRM website, tkram.utoronto.ca. Thanks everyone for uh, joining and have a wonderful afternoon. Mm -hmm.